understand it. So if you send any money, I'm so sorry for you. I am so sorry. And Austin, we're so glad to see you back, buddy. Been missing you. So good to see you. This is Zachary and David Welch, and we're just so glad they're here. If I have missed anybody, it was Jim and Bertley, but let's give a hand to all of our guests joining with us in this service over the World Wide Webcast this morning. We're so glad that you've joined us and just hope that you've already been blessed and will continue to be blessed in this service. I'm going to minister to you this morning from the subject Advancing over adversities. Would you say that with me? Advancing over adversities. Our theme for this year is Special Forces Advancing His Mission. And I want to clarify something that I think is very important. Now, when we think of uh, people in Special Forces or Special Ops Forces, they seem like perfect specimens. They have to pass all of these tests, not only physically, but mentally, emotionally, intellectually, in so many ways. And when we think about uh, the near perfection it seems like they have to reach to ever be chosen, I want to point out a difference in the way man does it and the way God does it right from the get-go of this year and clarify any discrepancy you might think because some might have thought, well, I'll, I'm disqualified for this reason or that reason or the other reason. No, those kinds of things don't disqualify us. If our hearts are right, then God can work with all the rest. And that's the sermon within a sermon I'm going to preach this morning. If you'll turn to me while, with me while you're still standing or put your attention on the screen for the reading of the word of God, we want to start with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, and read through verse 31. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 31. I'm sorry, let's back up to 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God does it differently. He hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised. Hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification, being set apart, and redemption, being redeemed, being saved from our fallen condition, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Oh, let's lift our hands and praise him. That's how God's special forces units are called. That's how God's special forces units work. That's how God is assembling his elite group of people to, to do advanced missions for him. Those who he can use and work through so that he and he alone gets the glory and the honor. You may be seated after you've turned to two or three people and said, advancing over adversities. I think in a group, in a group of this size this morning, can you hear me? Is this on? If I asked this question, there would definitely be some answers of yes. Is there anyone here who has a disability or a medical condition or some circumstance in your life that is very difficult? If so, you're not alone. 
many people with disabilities have contributed greatly to society. These include scientists, inventors, celebrities, singers, world leaders, and many, many other famous people. A disability is often used to refer to individual functioning, including physical impairment, sensory impairment, cognitive impairment, intellectual impairment, mental illness, and various types of chronic diseases. All of these fall under the category of disabilities. Of course, there are also millions of people worldwide who may not be famous to the world at large in the sense society would deem them famous, but these are probably the truest heroes who still live with, battle, and overcome their disabilities every single day of their life. Oh, I wish Brother Troy could have been here this morning as an example right in this congregation of great physical disability. But how many would believe he has advanced over that adversity every day of his life? If you'll put up, you thank you that you have it now up, this slide that is now posted on the screen. In it you will find men and women who have made a difference to the world including pictures and names of, of, of famous and well-known people here who, who have or had these types of different types of disabilities, some crippled, some handicapped, some having suffered great adversity at earlier times in their lives, and yet they persevered over that adversity to advance the cause of mankind. Albert Einstein the mathematician physicist who had a learning disability. Maybe many of you didn't realize that and did not even speak until the age of three. He had a very difficult time doing math in school. Can you believe it? It was also very hard for him to express himself through writing. Yet, he was one of the greatest minds of the 20th century who proposed the theory of relativity. Alexander Graham Bell had a learning disability, yet he brought us the invention of the telephone, which is still transforming communications through the world. I wonder if Alexander Graham Bell could see the exponential ways in which his invention has been taken to, to, to higher lengths. He would be utterly amazed himself. Thomas Edison, everybody say Detroit great inventor who had over 1,000 patents and his inventions are in various fields used in our daily lives. In his early life, he was thought to have a learning disability and he, he could not read. Thomas Edison could not read until the age of 12. And later, he himself admitted that he became deaf after pulling up to a train car by his ears. He might have been lacking in wisdom also. He first captured world attention by inventing the phonograph. His most popular invention, however, that we're using in this house today is the electric light bulb. He also developed the telegraph system. He also became a prominent businessman, and his business institution produced his inventions and marketed the pro products to the general populace. Helen Keller. Wow. Wow. Her whole life said disabilities. She was blind. That would be a tough disability in and of itself. She was also deaf and also mute. And yet, despite all of those adversities and disability, has, has become perhaps the iconic symbol of advancement and triumph despite severe adversity. John Milton, perhaps you've heard of him, the English author and poet who lived from the years 1608 to 1674. He became blind at the age of 43. However, he went on to create his most famous epic after he became blind called, and most of you have heard of this, Paradise Lost. The most famous musician in German history, a country that produced many uh, notable musicians and composers, but perhaps the greatest one of all was deaf 
at the later part of his life. He was a child in formation who would have been summarily marked for abortion in our present day society. He got the primary knowledge of music from his father, who was also a musician. He has some mysterious power which led him to create famous compositions one after another. He went to Vienna and learned from some of the prominent musicians there, but then far surpassed them. After the age of 28, he started becoming deaf. Now, that's bad for a musician trying to compose, and yet some of his greatest compositions were composed after he became deaf. His personal life was not peaceful but in disarray. He composed many piano sonatas such as Waldstein and Passionata. You might know him from Moonlight Sonata, and his name was none other than Ludwig von Beethoven. And then there's the American Walt Disney. You probably did not know that Walt Disney had a learning disability and yet over time impacted the world of imagination and is still impacting the world of entertainment and recreation to this day. Is there anyone in the house who has visited a Disney theme park sometime in your life? Would you raise your hand? Of course. Then there were three U.S. presidents. Franklin Delano Roosevelt had a severe case of polio from childhood. Most of the time he was relegated to a wheelchair, but he did not let that adversity stop him. He overcame it and he advanced over it and despite it to become governor of New York State and then be elected president of the United States, the only president in history that was elected for four terms. Then there was our first president, George Washington. The history books probably didn't tell you that he also had a learning disability. He could barely write and had very poor grammar skills, and yet he led us in the United States of America to victory as General George Washington over England in the establishment of this country we love. There was Woodrow Wilson, U.S. President from 1913 to 1921. He was a severely dyslexic person with that that, that very acute learning disability. I believe we could add Abraham Lincoln to this group. I believe Abraham Lincoln would have been diagnosed in today's world as having chemical depression. He had to cope with debilitating, deep bouts of depression to overcome in order to lead the nation through its time of greatest crisis known as the Civil War. None of these famous people allowed their personal adversities or disabilities to stop them from advancing toward the great goals of accomplishment in their respective fields of labor. The word of the Lord tells us about some disabled men whose names are not even recorded. Yet together, they accounted for one of the more amazing victories recounted in the time of Elisha the prophet for the nation of Israel against King Ben-Hadad and the Syrians. We pick up this amazing story in 2 Kings chapter 6 and 7. Conditions were not in an optimum for Israel after the prophetic word of God that was working through the prophet Elijah caused King Ben-Hadad ben -Hadad of Syria to become both flabbergasted and then enraged. In fact, as we read from 2 Kings chapter 6 verses 8 through 12 in the Amplified, we find these words. When the king of Syria was warring against Israel, after counseling with his servants, he said, now in such and such a place shall be my camp. Then the man of God would send to the king of Israel saying, beware that you pass not such a place for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent to the place of which Elisha told and warned him, and thus he protected and saved himself there not once, 
not twice. In fact, I don't know how many times the Word of God just says repeatedly. That implies at least, I think, three times or more this happened. Therefore, the mind of the king of Syria was greatly, greatly troubled by this thing. He called his servants and said, Will you show me who of us is for the king of Israel? Who's the traitor in our camp? One of his servants said, None of us, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedchamber. I'm thankful we have a God who works in supernatural ways to work with his people. So Ben-Hadad decides that they must locate and seize the prophet Elisha. Finding out he was residing in a city of Israel called Dothan. Remember Dothan? That was where... Uh, Joseph went when he was apprehended by his brothers and put in the pit and later sold into slavery. Here we find Dothan mentioned again. That's where the prophet Elisha was residing. And the Syrian king sent a great army, not a, a, a small group, but a great army with chariots to capture Elisha. However, once again, God displays his supernatural power in protecting his prophet for the word of God tells us in 2 Kings 6, 15 through 18, when the servant of the man of God rose early and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was around the city. Elisha's servant said to him, Ah, oh, alas, my master, what shall we do? And Elisha didn't even get a little bit anxious or troubled. He said, Fear not, for those with us are more than those with him. And I think at that point, Elisha's servant thought he must be hallucinating. But Elisha was seen with eyes that the servant could not yet see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, Smite this people with fire. Blindness, I pray you. And God smote them with blindness, as Elijah asked. We think about Paul doing that to Elamus the sorcerer, but that wasn't the first time it happened. Elisha exercised that supernatural authority from God also earlier. Then Elisha led the opposing army, blinded in their blindness, away from Dothan to the capital city of Samaria where the king of Israel had all of his armies. Now, the king of Israel is poised to slaughter them if he chooses. But instead, Elisha instructs Israel's king to mercifully, instead of destroy them, provide and set great provisions of food and water before them and send them home back to Syria in peace. What return does the king get for his kindness and for his mercy? Well, the enraged, embarrassed king Ben-Hadad returns the king of Israel's kindness with more anger, more enragement, and sends forces now against Israel and actually sets up a siege against the city of Samaria, the capital city of those ten tribes of Israel. Conditions get bad. Conditions go from bad to worse. Conditions then go from bad to worse to desperate. In fact, conditions became so dire during this siege that people were eating donkey's heads, paying a huge sum of money to find a donkey's head to try to eat. And then they went to the very extreme when they were eating dung. It went even worse when one woman complained to the king while he was walking on the wall, King, oh king, help me. And he said, how can I help you? Do I have anything in the wine presses? Do I have anything in the storage bins? How can I help you? And she said, oh king, my friend made a pact with me that if, if, if we would kill my child and eat it today, then she would kill 
her child and we would eat it tomorrow, but now she's hidden her child. Can you imagine the circumstances that existed in the city of Samaria at that time? The king was so distressed by all of this that he ripped and tore. The King James word is rent his royal robes and all the people saw that even the king under those royal robes was dressed in sackcloth. But instead of turning to the man of God, this man of God who had proved over and over to him that he had heard from God and had and given deliverance to the king and his armies, instead of turning to the man of God in faith, believing for a miracle, the king of Israel now turns on the man of God and in anger and frustration blames Elisha for the whole mess and sent a group of men to behead Elisha the prophet. That's appreciation for you. But God once again is talking to his prophet. He lets Elisha know what was going on and will Elisha said, bar the door. Don't let them in the door. That murderous son of Jezebel is coming to kill me. And they began to talk and have a conversation through the door because the king had sent the messengers on before him, but he was following to observe the dastardly deed that he had ordered. And so they're talking through the closed door, and finally the king relents and did what he should have done in the first place. Instead of continuing to turn against the man of God, he realized what I need to do is ask advice of the man of God of what we should do at this point of desperation. The reply was utterly mind-boggling. Elisha, the prophet, says in the midst of these unbelievably bad conditions, by this time tomorrow, food will be more plentiful than food is now scarce today. This seemed so utterly preposterous to the king's captain of the army, who one would think would be the obvious choice to lead the forces of the king to a special forces type victory, right? And yet, he was full of unbelief. Now, let me tell you something about unbelief. Unbelief is categorized as sin. In fact, the Bible says that the fearful and the what? The unbelieving shall be cast into the lake of fire. When you start having a tendency from your natural nature to start becoming skeptical and unbelieving of the word of God and the promises of God and the prophetic word of God, oh, that's a time to shake yourself and repent as rapidly as you can because unbelief separates us from God just as pride does and usually it's our own human pride that causes us to pull the handle of unbelief. And so, not only would this captain who refused to believe the word of the Lord through his prophet not be used by God in this miraculous turnaround victory, he would not even participate in the spoils. Then the captain, 2 Kings 7-2 Amplified says, Then the captain, on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God and said, If the Lord should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? But Elisha said, You shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. I don't want ever to remove myself through skepticism and unbelief to a place where I will see what God had promised, but will not to be able to be a participator in it. Would you lift your hands and ask God to preserve you in belief, preserve you in faith. God honors the believing people. God honors the trusting people. God honors those who say, I don't see how on earth it could happen, but if God said it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. 
So who would God use as his special forces soldiers to advance his kingdom to great victory at this perilous time for Israel? He would choose some quite unlikely vessels seemingly overcome with too much adversity from a disabling chronic disease to even be considered for special forces duty in God's work through human eyes. Now on center stage in this drama enter four disabled lepers. Leprosy was a disease that forced separation from the rest of society, essentially making them outcasts on the fringe of life. Yet these are the very special forces tools God chooses to use to catalyze and precipitate one of the great miraculous turnarounds in a battle in biblical history. You see, in God's special forces as opposed to man's special forces, you don't have to be an astounding physical specimen. Can you clap your hands to the Lord for that? <laughs> Nor do you have to have a perfect unblemished past some people will try to disqualify you for things in your past, but Jesus says, come unto me, ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Here are my hands open wide to the backslider. I'm looking and longing for you to come home, and I will have a place of honor, and I can use you after you do. You do not have to be without hindrances, without distractions, or present adversities even in your life to qualify for God's special forces. These four lepers decided they had nothing to lose but their lives, which were slipping away anyway due to the dreaded disease called leprosy. And they decided, why sit we here outside the city gates. If we go in, we starve. Let us not retreat and let us not just sit here and feel sorry for ourselves. Let us advance to the camp of the enemy. The worst they can do is kill us and who knows, they might take us alive and feed us. So they arose in the twilight and went to the Syrian camp. Woo! God does awesome things with disabled people, with people that have been crippled in some way in their past, when people that are undergoing great adversities, he will do such great things with those people who will just say, would you lift up your hands with me right now? Let's say it, here am I, Lord. Use me. Let's say it again. Here am I, Lord. Use me. Let's say it again. Here am I, Lord. Use me. And when we will have that attitude genuinely from our heart of hearts, we can have the same thing happen as they march just four disabled lepers who had lived with adversity for we don't know how many years, decided to advance on the camp of the enemy. And when they did, they came to the edge of the camp and no man was there for the Lord had caused the Syrian army. This is 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 5 through 8. The Lord had made the Syrian army to hear a noise of chariots and horses, the noise of a great army, although it was just four disabled lepers walking along. And yet God had magnified the sound of those eight feet hitting the dusty pavement going toward the enemy and caused such fear to come upon them. They said, to one another, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to come upon us. So the Syrians arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents 
their horses, donkeys, even the camp as it was, everybody say food, and fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into one tent and ate and drank and carried away silver, gold, and clothing and went and hid them in the darkness. Then they entered another tent and carried from there also and went and hid it. But here's the point. Everybody say, don't miss this. Here's the point of the story that I love the most. At first, it seemed as though they were basically thinking, what do we have to lose? And maybe we will be kept alive. But not only was God using them unwittingly, God was also changing them in the process from selfish-minded to kingdom-minded vessels of his use. And there isn't a one of us in this house today that God isn't working on to try to change us from self-centered vessels who try to Take all of the good of the blessings of God for ourselves. And he wants to turn us into kingdom-minded people who see the bigger picture than how it affects me and how it benefits me and mine. This is what happens to us when we'll give ourselves to advance the missions of his kingdom. We are transformed in the process from a basically self-centered worldview to a kingdom-minded view. When we get kingdom-minded, we understand I'm not, not, I'm not doing very well to merely focus on my needs, my salvation, my blessings. But I must do all I can to meet the needs of everyone in the kingdom. So here's the best part of the story. It's their attitude adjustment. And we find it in 2 Kings chapter 7 when they said one to another, we're not doing right. Turn to someone and say, we're not doing right. They said, this is a day of glad news. And we are silent and do not speak of. If we wait until daylight, some punishment will come upon us for not reporting at once. So now come, let us go and tell the king's household. So they did come and, and, and called to the gatekeepers of the city. They were still what? The Bible does not tell us that they were suddenly healed and cleansed of their disability. Now wouldn't that be a great story? Yes, it would. But I think it's a greater story that God did not heal them of their disability. He used them in spite of their disabilities and their problems. And I don't know about you, but that gives me hope for my own life. That gives me hope for all of our lives. That despite the things we struggle with, the things from our past, the things in our present, God can use us in his special forces to accomplish his work and his kingdom while we're still in our disabilities. Sometimes he does not deliver us from those on purpose so we can understand what was the last phrase of our text this morning. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord, let's lift our hands and praise him because his ways are above our ways so far past our finding out. He doesn't think like men think. Thank you, Lord. Oh. And so they told the gatekeepers of the city, we came to the camp for the Syrians and behold, there was neither sight nor sound of man there, only the horses and donkeys tied and the tents as they were. And the king was skeptical. I can understand that on one level. It's called a human level. But had not the prophet said something miraculous was going to happen in how many days' time? One day's time. And the king was not yet latching on fully to fully believe 
what the prophet had said. He's skeptical. He's thinking this is a trick of the Syrians. They're going to draw us out there to start gathering spoil, and they're hiding. They're going to ambush us while we're out trying to gather spoil. So what does the king do? And from a natural standpoint, it was wisdom, natural wisdom, but not spiritual wisdom, really. He sent scouts ahead to confirm that the Syrians had indeed fled and had left more goods and spoil, not just in their camp, but they were getting rid of spoil all the way to the Jordan River, trying to get across it and hightail it home to Syria. Then the people, 2 Kings 7, 1, tell us everything the prophet said was now happening, just as the prophet had spoken it. Then the people, 2 Kings 7, 1, went out and plundered the tents of the Syrians, so a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel as, would you read that last phrase with me? As the Lord had spoken through Elisha. Oh. But remember that unbelieving captain who essentially mocked the word of the Lord through Elisha? Remember him? The captain who seemingly should have been the vessel used to win the great victory and participate in this mighty miracle. And yet his unbelief and skepticism became his tragic downfall even to an untimely death. 2 Kings 7, 9, and 10 wrap up that part of the story by saying the king had appointed the captain on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. And the starving people trampled him in the gate as they struggled to get through for food. And he died as the man of God had foretold when the king came down to him. He saw it, but he didn't participate in it because of his unbelief. What can we learn about advancing his mission from this poignant historical narrative this morning? Four disabled lepers decided to advance instead of retreat or just stay where they were. Despite the adversity of severe afflictions and weaknesses, then they became people-centered instead of self-centered. I wonder, is there anyone in the house this morning that wants to say, God, would you make me more people-centered than self-centered. Can I see a show of hands of of those who really want God to work on you in that way to make you more people-centered and kingdom-centered than merely self-centered? They became examples of what our attitude should be in advancing the mission of the Lord even when we seem partially incapacitated for whatever reasons. God most Often, I say most often, it is not the exception, but it is the rule that God most often gets his work done through imperfect vessels struggling through adversities. Yet the work gets done, and he receives the praise and the glory Think about it. He used an imperfect vessel named Moses, apparently who had such a horrendous speech impediment of some variety that God could not let him go to Pharaoh on himself. He wouldn't have been able to get the words out properly. So so God says, Moses, you're going to be the leader. I'm going to talk to you, but then you tell what I've told you to your brother Aaron who can understand you, and then Aaron will be your mouthpiece to the Pharaoh, John Mark, New Testament, could have been labeled a quitter. Sometimes we label ourselves as quitters or a backslider and think, therefore, there's no more hope for us to be effectively used for God. But let me assure you of something this morning. That is not the case. John Mark was later commended after his earlier episode of quitting a missionary journey for the familiarity and comforts of home. The Apostle Paul, who had earlier given him harsh criticism to the point he absolutely separated from Barnabas, his missionary partner because Barnabas insisted we must give this young man another chance. Paul would hear none of it. He was harsh in his 
criticism. But later in one of his letters, he realized he was wrong. And he gave this same John Mark great commendation for his contributions to the advancement of the kingdom. Maybe Paul had to learn this lesson himself through being humbled a bit through the thorn of adversity that God allowed him to suffer. Be careful of your criticism of other people. Be very careful of your judgments of other people because if you have a harsh opinion of others going through things, you don't really understand because you've never walked in their moccasins. You better be careful. I've watched it over 40 plus years of ministry. People who rose up in those kinds of attitudes. I have seen God bring things into their lives that humbled them and pulled them down to have a totally different perspective of things. And this must be part of what happened to the great apostle Paul. I'm not, forgive me for saying the great apostle Paul. The greatness is of God and not of men. But Paul was humbled through his thorn of adversity that God allowed him to suffer. The thorn God would not remove from Paul despite Paul having asked God three times earnestly to do so. But God said, no, Paul, you need this. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but you need this, Paul, lest you be exalted above measure for all the revelations that I have given unto you you just live with it and you keep advancing over the adversity so Paul later instructs the church that with God's special forces soldier which he uses to advance his kingdom God sometimes leaves those special forces soldiers with some adversities with some weaknesses in their flesh or with some circumstances that that seem to make it more difficult to operate in God's calling so that special forces vessel will realize where the power comes from so Paul would later write to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7 amplified however we possess this treasure the divine light of the gospel in frail human vessels of earth that the grandeur and the exceeding greatness of the power may be shown to be from God and not from ourselves. Oh, we tend to have heroes and and the Lord taught me that I should stop having heroes, that Jesus should be my only hero. I have men and women of God that I greatly respect and admire and take inspiration from, but I don't say anymore that person is my hero. I want Jesus to be on that pedestal. Men can fall from that pedestal, but I'm telling you Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the rock that can't be moved. He will not change, and he cannot fall off the pedestal. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, Paul further enunciates to these Christians at Corinth this principle I'm preaching about today. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, Paul responds, therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. In other words, understand, if I'm trying to glory in my own ability, my own willpower, my own determination, my own saying, I've got this thing by the tail and I'm going to do it for God. Oh no, you just might not get it done for God in that way. But if you'll say, I don't know how I could ever do this For God, but God, here I am. If you can find a way to do it through me, then you'll get all the glory and the honor and the praise. Let's clap our hands to the Lord. He goes on to say, Therefore, I take pleasure 
in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. That's the spiritual special forces soldier. We don't have to wait until our personal conditions are optimized before we offer ourselves willingly as special forces volunteers to be used to advance the missions of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just have to be yielded. Everybody say yielded. That means I'm not holding on to it. I'm letting go. I'm yielding to the work of God in it. God's way, God's way, God's plan, God's power, God's timing. And I'm going to be a believing vessel, not like the captain who leaned, the king leaned on him, that unbelieving captain who saw it but didn't get to partake of it. But let me, Lord, be a yielding, believing vessel, even in my imperfect conditions and my unoptimal conditions. The parable of the prodigal tells us God is willing and able to receive and work with the backslider with open arms. Don't ever think because you've made mistakes, because you've fallen back, or even because you're, you haven't really fully backslidden, but you've grown lukewarm in the battle. Remember, the text that we started with, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31. If you'll put that up again. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the what? Foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen what? The weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And what kinds of things? The base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. God is doing some things that are not yet in time, but in the mind of God they already are because God has spoken them through the word of prophecy. So in God's mind, who sees the end from the beginning, those things already are. We just haven't gotten to that point of time where we see them yet. Can you praise God for promises that are still coming to pass that we just haven't seen the fulfillment yet that God's already seen the fulfillment of? And that's why he, he used his men to give the prophecies in the first place. And it's all that no flesh should glory in his presence. So as you stand with me, our focus for this year will not be. Did you hear me? Our focus will not be upon our hindrances. Our focus will not be on our disabilities. Our focus will not be on, well, wish we had money to do this and wish we had money to do that. Our focus will be on the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns all the gold of the earth. Our focus will not be upon our circumstantial adversity. If you keep your focus on that, it will add to your weakness. But if you will take your focus off those things as reasons to yourself, in reasoning with yourself, why well, I can't do this and I can't do that. And you'll just say, Lord, you know what I can do. You see the situation I'm in, but you see what I can do. Here I am. Use me. Let me advance over the adversities. We're going to set our focus upon his ability to use us in spite of those realities. I didn't say those fantasies. I said those realities. But we will trust our Lord to enable us to keep advancing his mission for us over our adversities and disabilities. We will watch. Just as it was with Paul. We will watch his strength being made complete or perfect in our weaknesses. Every one of us, without exception, can advance toward the enemy camp in faith and trust that he will help us to storm the gates of hell, as it were, to shine his light, to pour out his salt, 
and to sow the seeds of the words of his truth. To herald to people his hope. To implant in people the joy of his glorious gospel. And then we can in meekness and wisdom do all of that with godly reverence. Giving the glory to him. Would you just lift your hands? Let's give him some glory. Let's give him some praise. Let's give him some thanksgiving that he's able to let us advance over our adversities to accomplish his purposes. Thank you, Lord. That's why I'm inviting right now any and all to this altar this morning to receive of the Lord his strength to be made perfect in our weaknesses, to receive a fresh cleansing of his precious blood for our sins and struggles of flesh and spirit, to receive the renewing of his Holy Spirit in our human spirits, to let Jesus Christ renew our minds to think and respond like him and to be freshly baptized with a renewed zeal to rejoice in sowing the seed of the word of the gospel whenever and wherever he will give us the opportunity. It's between you and God this morning. If you've heard that voice of Satan say you're not qualified for special forces it's a lie if anyone was not qualified it was those four unnamed lepers but God said they were qualified because they made the right choices despite their disabilities The Lord gave me an order in which for us to pray at this altar service this morning. And we're going to start off praying for a fresh cleansing, a fresh bathing of His precious blood for our sins and struggles of flesh and spirit. Both our sins of commission and our sins of omission. Would you just pray with me right now for a fresh bathing and cleansing spirit, soul, mind, will, emotions, and even sins of the body that may have been committed for a fresh cleansing of those things we've committed and those things we have omitted to do that we should have done. Oh, God, would you bathe me afresh in your blood, Lord. God, I come to the altar again. I come, as it were, to that brazen altar again, saying, would you let me be a living sacrifice? Would you let your precious blood bathe me and wash over me again? Your word says your blood keeps on cleansing us from all sin. Oh, let this be one of those keep on cleansing moments for all of us, Lord, that you'll wash things out of our thought processes that are not in harmony with your thoughts. Wash things out of our emotions that are not in harmony with what you want us to have in our emotions. Wash things out of our own selfish, determined will that are not in harmony with your will and do it all from that flowing, that cleansing of that deepest place within us that is created in your image, our human spirit. Lord, wash us, wash us, wash us from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. We might properly reverence you, Lord. Secondly, I want us to pray for a renewing of his Holy Spirit to be stirred up within us to freshly renew our minds to think like him. The devil wants us to think like him. 
God wants us to think like God. And we have to pray. You can drift into human thinking without hardly realizing that's what you're doing. And yet, we have got to pray. That's part of the purpose of our prayer life, to keep the Spirit of God renewed and stirred up within us. That's why Paul wrote to Timothy and say, said, Stir up the gift that is in you, that was given you by the laying on the hands of the presbytery. Stir it up! Everybody say, Stir me up, Lord! Stir up your spirit within us to renew my mind afresh that I can respond like you, think like you, act like you, speak like you, and be in agreement with your holy word. Let's pray that. Oh, God, stir up your spirit within me. Renew your spirit within me. God, activate it in such a powerful way that my mind will be freshly renewed to think According to your way of thinking, oh God.